on the beach and it was lots of chemicals. Adelaide, darling, Adelaide. You know that funny little town where I come from. It's, that's where I said Adelaide training, just because I said Adelaide training program. So I'm being rude to you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a really uh, a spectacularly fabulous venue, just to make it feel really bad. And one whole side of the Woona Ballroom, that one whole side with windows and on the beach on the beach it's a bit stinky at semaphore to be honest and we used to call it uh, semaphore is a bit is trumanville it's like, it's so funny because there's so many halfway houses anyone know semaphore in adelaide yeah there's a lot of halfway houses so there's a lot of like thursdays at the bank is spectacularly funny because the all the halfway houses decant all the you know people who need their payments and there are they are a rich tapestry of life, let's say. So yeah, you, you sort of cross the Port River going to Semaphore and it's just, spec, you know, it's just that old fashioned, old, you know, jetty road kind of thing and little shops on either side and ice creams and little ice creams, not gelati and, you know, everything's just fish and chips. Yeah, it is, it's wide. Sorry? Is there? Just saying, just putting it out there in a sensory kind of way. Um, all right, so lie on your back. I also have to, they, they were a very indulgent bunch, the Adelaide training crew. There was this pack of women who would, uh, after work, I didn't find this out for quite a few segments. There was a bar downstairs, and it's to go down there and sit on the bar on the beach side and take it in turns to buy a bottle of sparkling wine. So they were all the interstaters, so they didn't have any responsibilities. Uh, so they could just hang out. So it wasn't the Jan Rowland. I think Jan Rowland may have joined them. She would have been invited every now and again. Mostly it was the interstaters. Yeah. Yeah, she did that late at Semaphore, Trimmonville. AKA Trimmonville. 2000, 2004, we finished in 2004. Yeah. Okay. So we've been quite extroverted again. Like yesterday, we'll talk about that. You know, oriented outward, sharing, communicating in language, so spoken language. And now I'm, I'm inviting you, asking you to. Turn your attention to yourself in relation to the floor. So there's an extraceptive element to that. The floor is external to you. And then the interceptive kind of element to that. What are you sensing? What are you sensing with? So we've got quite a few choices from a sensing point of view. There's that tactile sense of what's touching, what are you touching, what's touching you. The position sense is pretty dormant now because you're not necessarily moving, right? The, um, the proprioceptors are primarily in the muscles, but the muscles are quiet what you're getting is a quiet signal. So it's the, you're interpreting the absence of a signal as something. And actually, you do that with your, one, a couple of little organs in your, within your vestibular system as well. The absence of a signal means something. So this learning from, from, from the absence of something is a really you know, kind of interesting concept. And if your eyes were very kind of lazy in your head and let's imagine that the pupil was heavy 
and it could kind of, you know, if it's looking towards the ceiling with your eyes closed, but it's heavy there, a little bit of, if you just tipped it a little bit one way, it would fall to the left. Both pupils would fall to the left. Just get the sense that the eyes could just fall to the left. And then you quietly bring them back to the middle, i.e. looking to the ceiling. And then they could, you could kind of tip them and they would fall to the right. So how far could we get this sense of effort to decrease? And then bring them back to the middle. And again, it wouldn't, what would it take to just tip them so that they would roll back in your head? This absence of noise, absence of sense of effort. Then bring them back to the middle, the ceiling. And what would it take to tip them so that they fell towards in the direction of your feet? So some of you are noticing with this, I, with this, you know, kind of concept of vision, you know, the light rays entering your eye rather than you looking outward, but the, your vision coming into your eye. It's it, it can change the tone in the back of your neck. And then that might have also even been the case when you were listening with softer ears and letting the sound come to your ear. Because what do you do when you're chasing the sound or trying to hear hard or see hard? What's the movement that you do? Your chin coming forward or craning and you cock your head one way or the other to bring your dominant eye forward or your dominant ear forward. So could you imagine going between those two states of kind of craning to look in front of you or hear something and then allowing it to come to you? Could you just take those movements without the sensory stimulus and reproduce those actions? They may be in your imagination. Question? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So you're imagining that you're lying there with this idea that the, what you're looking at in your imagination, so your eyes are actually shut, is coming into your eyes, entering your eyes, and the sound, and you can use my voice if you like, as the stimulus, is quietly coming into your ears. So there's, you're just this passive receiver, like you actually mentioned a little bit about this in the talk. Now imagine that a different state of affairs where you are looking hard for something, where you are listening hard you're craning to hear something. And there is a movement or an action associated with that effort. Imagine what that movement, that positioning, that state of being feels like, senses. Do it in your imagination. And often the movement is one of craning your head forward, there might be some rotation because you'll bring your dominant eye forward or your dominant ear forward. More often than not, there's a shortening in the back of the neck, actually. It can be somewhat stereotypical. But fill up what it is for you, that trying really hard to, you know, you're grabbing things with your eyes, grabbing things with your ears, and then let it go and do the opposite. Let the sound stimulus or the visual stimulus enter the receptacle, the eye or the ear. And go be between those two states so that you're quite clear, bless you, that they're different. And it might not just be a tightening in the face or the back of the neck. There might be a tightening in the diaphragm. It might be a forward shift of the shoulders. Or I don't know. I don't know what it might be. And leave that and roll on to your stomach. And have your face turned to the right. 
and your hands somewhere around on the floor, around your head somewhere. And bend your knees. Find a place where you can balance you know, on the front of your femurs, at the, at particularly at the knee end. There's quite a nice little kind of platform area. And your shin bones can stack up. And start to do tiny little movements of your feet. And they can do anything pretty much, other than they don't take you out of your, the prone position, this lying on your front position. And so long as they're, you know, they're kind of asymmetrical, they're doing things different to each other. So how could you discover, play with wiggling your feet around in all different ways, this kind of curious but exploratory way? And I tell you, it's so fun looking at this because it actually looks like your two feet are having a conversation with each other. Because they're not doing exactly the same thing, it's not symmetrical. And they're kind of almost reacting to each other. It's so funny. Like, <laughs> uh, and then they go, might, one, one might go and touch one and the other. And you could imagine saying, I love you. What do you love about me? I love your calluses. No, that's just a joke. Good. I love the way you smell. And they could go, what plane are they staying in? Are they always, you know, are they coming closer to your bum? Are they coming closer to the floor? Are they going more to the left? Are they going more to the right? And start to become aware of where this movement might be happening. Possibilities. Oh, they're so chatty. It'd be a great sock commercial too. <laughs> Those of you who've got socks on. <laughs> Can I just say, I'm really glad that people, oh no, someone has got the, I don't mind the woolen toe socks, but those um, vaguely kind of, um, what are those, the socks that look the, like they're made out of wetsuit material? I find them quite spooky. I don't know why. With the grips on the soles. Have you got some? I find them quite spooky to look at. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, is that the ones you're talking about that you walk in? No. Is that what they're called? Oh. In, in, inside here, there's a few people downstairs who wear them, and I, I don't know why I find them quite spooky. Anyway, there you go. Little confessions. Uh, I can background them. It's, I can live with it. Okay, good. Leave it. Rest your legs long for a moment. And what's the influence of that movement, that little play? Now bring your head to the right, if it wasn't already, and have your arms in that Egyptian pose. So with your head to the right, the right hand will be palm down and the left hand behind you will be palm up and the elbow and the shoulder on both sides is roughly 90 and the hand that's on the face side is uh, up, it, you know, it's not, is the Loretta other way around, that's it, that's it. So the face is turned towards the hand that is palm down and it's closer to your, and it is um, up relative to the, to you. Um, other way, Sue. That way, yeah. That's it. So here's where the up is kind of different. The up is relative to your head. So it's your right hand that is in front of your face. Palm down, that's it. And the left hand is palm up. And it's only flexible for people who can do it both ways. I just want to, you know, not, and I don't, when I say flexible, flexible in the shoulder, because it's hard to do the opposite if you have, if your shoulder blades can't slide. Now, very slowly, 
find a way to turn your head to the left, but with this idea that your whole self is part of the turning. So you can keep your whole self in mind. And find a way that your arms leave the floor absolutely minimally. So there may be a way, some of you may have been doing this, where they lengthen out away from you. So your elbows lengthen, extend, and then they kind of swing around and then turn into the other thing on the floor. And so the, if, let's say the game now is to find a way where the arms leave the floor. In fact, the arms never leave the floor. Find a way that the arms don't leave the floor and the elbows. Obviously, different parts of them touch. But basically, the arms stay the same. So that there's a point where, you, where your arms are wide open on the floor. It's like you're going to give the, the floor a big hug. Like open arms. I love you, floor. I love you, the entire floor. I don't just love the red spots on the carpet. I love the whole thing. Now, as you keep doing that movement, which is your whole self, bring your, bend your knees up and have your, free, your, your feet kind of free to have a little, you know, a little bit of a chat. So, but they're free, they're not pinned to the floor. Where, where, how would they like to chat to each other as you continue to turn your head and your arms and your attention is inclusive, so you love your whole self with your attention and the floor, and your breathing, and your sternum, and the ribs at the front, and the ribs at the back, and your collarbones, and your pelvis at the front, and your coccyx, and your knees, and your big toes, and your thumbs, what, you know, whatever else you've, I've left out. And now you are officially floor fish. And with your feet up and your pelvis freer to move, does that help the turning of the head? So you can feel that somehow or other your head bone is connected to your tailbone. And then let your legs go back onto the floor but they're not doggo on the floor anymore. You've given them license to be a little responsive to the head. And the head and the arms and the chest turning, and then the pelvis is free to support. And you can hear the timing of the movement, the swoosh of the arms. As you're changing orientation, the timing can change, leave it, and find a way at some point to roll onto your back. Somehow a movement of rolling onto your back could flow out of this. There might be some little invitation where you could swim onto your back. And what's the influence of swimming on the floor like that? Mm -hmm. 
you go back to those lines of this morning, the length of you in various ways, the length of your legs and the length of your sides, the length of your neck at the front and the back, the length across the back of your shoulders, the length across the front of your shoulders, which I guess more accurately is that your breadth, the length of your arms, And how's your breathing? If you do that kind of diaphragmatic thing, just using your diaphragm, fluttering up and down. Now, how is that today compared to yesterday? Just pump up your tires a little bit. And leave your diaphragm to settle back into some kind of easy going background. We've foregrounded it, it's, it's background. It doesn't have to completely disappear. It's just there quietly. Has anyone ever said to you, I love your diaphragm? Maybe they have. Maybe this is the new opportunity. They know you really well. Because they've acknowledged the whole of you, so they have, they're entitled to go to the detail. I guess it's a bit like when your partner says, does my bum look big in this? You don't want to go into that detail. You just say, you look marvellous, dear. <laughs> Because if you enter into that level of detail, it's a hiding for nothing. Guys have their equivalent, you know, do I look manly and this is my stomach flat and this, I don't know, whatever, whatever is in your self-image. Roll onto your tummy again, onto your stomach. Have your head turned to the right and your hands somewhere on the floor around your head. And bend your knees. And this time, take your feet. So the distance between them stays roughly the same. Uh, take them a little bit to the left slowly to the left and then back to the middle fast. Slowly to the left, back to the middle fast. Slowly to the left, back to the middle fast. And keep doing that. This is the windscreen wiper lesson. But slow lowering, fast lifting. But it's, it's odd, isn't it, to be so directive with the timing. This is practicing something quite interesting. The slow lowering is using the rotators in your hip joints. I'll just give you the heads up about what the magic is here. They're working eccentrically and then they're doing a fast, concentric action back to the middle against gravity. So you're really allowing those rotators to lengthen slowly with the help of gravity and then shorten them quickly. This is a trick that we'll, you, we, we will use, we do use all the time in Feldenkrais. crisis, this exploration of the full length of a muscle from quite long to quite short and with different timings. So we're not, we don't stretch in here, right? Because we think the muscle is an extension of the nervous system. You know, it's not a, a passive thing to be stretched. It's something to be invited to actively lengthen and actively shorten. Because it's, it is, you know, it's, you know, we talked about this morning, where does the nervous system end? Well, actually, it's intimately connected with every fibre of the, 
of the muscles. And in fact, there are little fake muscle fibers that are the receptors, completely infiltrated. Leave it and rest with your legs long for a minute. And what's the influence of that funny little exploration on the length of your legs and the feeling of your hip in your hip joints? And now bend your knees and have your feet play that little exploration game. They can have a little chat with each other. And where can they go in space now? And then have them find some kind of equipoise, so somewhere that's, you know, sort of neutral. And have your arms in the Egyptian thing. So if your head's still to the right, it just means your left arm has to go in that 90 degrees downward and your right arm needs to be a little bit more 90 degrees. And slowly, slowly find a way to turn your head to the left and change over your arms and find the place of being rested on with you facing the left. And where do your feet want to go in that position? And then come back face to the right. And where does it kind of make sense for your feet to go when you go that way to help so that the whole of you is moving and make it a continuous kind of movement now, this circling of the arms on the floor and the circling of the head, this rotation, and the pelvis is rolling on the floor. So pay attention actually to the rotation of the pelvis. As one side lifts up more. And as the hips rotate in their sockets, you kind of get the feeling that all of me is rotating. That's, could you also just fake it that it's really nice? If it doesn't feel spontaneously really nice, fake it that it feels really nice. So you can feel kind of luxurious. No big deal, like effortless, cat-like. I'm sorry, cat, I'm not talking about you. But, you know, maybe cat moves like a cat. I just realised. <laughs> we have a real-life cat in the room. Leave it. Find a way at some point. How could this movement turn into a roll onto your back? Without it feeling incongruent. Kind of, just that's it, swimming onto your back. Beautiful. You've just invented a new Feldy role. And everybody's was quite unique. And I have no desire to standardise it. And again, what's the influence of that on your state of being? What's foreground in your sensing? What's background? What could you bring to the foreground that would be interesting? One more time, roll onto your stomach. 
and leave your legs long. And quietly go through the turning of the head so you can start off with the head to the right and one arm up and one arm down. Slowly change over. And now your legs aren't pinned to the floor, but they're, they're not kind of up in the air. Let's leave them long, leave them long. But there's still something that they could do. Actually, more in your pelvis. What do you remember that your pelvis was doing that was part of this movement, the rolling of the pelvis? Could there still be an echo of the pelvis rolling a little bit without it being a big drama? You know, it's just, it's, you're now quite clear that might be quite a background movement, but the pelvis is influenced. It's part of this movement. And there's a little turning in the legs, just a tiny turning. You know, so most of you are lying, you know, the weight's on the front of your feet so the, or the dorsum of the feet, the toenail side of your feet. There's an ever so slight shift of weight as your head rolls to the right and rolls, lifts and rolls to the left with your arms. And it can be as small as you like, but it's still there. How small could it be that it's still there? So that you can truly say, yeah, the whole of me is turning my head to the right. So my head is, is moving my head involves the whole of me, in, not in a gratuitous way, like in an informed way. And therefore, you can pay attention to the whole of you. So my head is not just this little shag on a rock. You know, it's the, everything's supporting the head. Everything's looking out for the head, helping it roll. It doesn't have to do this on its own. It's so nice, so collegial. Your shoulder blades are helping, your sternum's helping, your ribs are helping. And therefore the neck is not under so much pressure to get everything done. Then your eyes can go with your head. And the next time you do it, have the eyes go opposite a few times. Really clarify the role of the eyes. So you literally take them out of the picture and see, and then put them back in the picture. And leave it and roll onto your back. How's that? So for some people, lying on their tummy is quite confronting. I work with people who, you know, we, we need to work, we can take lessons and lessons and lessons for them to not feel anxious on their stomach. Because they have trouble breathing on their stomach. And then other people, I would never, in the first couple of lessons, ask them to lie on their back because they'd feel anxious with their belly exposed. Not that they would put it in those words, but, you know, they can't be this long and open. So you just be aware that way, way, way in the background of you, those things are happening. Those little reactions and responses, those little preferences for being on your tummy or on your back are there. but you deal with those little challenges so easily. You can, in this forum, you can kind of bring them to the foreground a bit and say, oh yeah, I do have a vague preference for that. That's okay, no, it's okay. Quietly roll up to sitting. No, no, go on, noisily roll up to sitting. Why did I say quietly? Just go on, make it. And then come up to standing. 
yeah, why do you have to do what I say all the time? Yeah, yeah, come up standing, really noisy. And then go back inside at yourself, not when you're inside. And now when you turn, what's turning? You feel this turning around your feet, around your hip joints, around your whole self. So elegant. So what, what, what's looking, when you look behind you, you know, how much of you looks behind? Every, everything does a little bit, right? It's all having a little contribution, no matter how small. And then walk. And as you're walking, imagine that someone's calling you from behind. You keep walking, but you're turning. And you can go forward and look behind you. And that's not contradictory. So you can see where you're going and you can see where you've been. Oh, it's very philosophical. You know, it's like your karma. If you want to know what your karma was, look at your, you know, what your past come. Oh, what I can't remember that bloody thing. You know, look behind you. Look at your life before. See what your current. You know, you oh, I know. No, I'm never do it. You do it for me. <laughs> now walk backwards. So the the skill of walking backwards is actually to be able to turn and look every now and again. <laughs> so how easily do you inhabit the world behind you? Can you go back into your past? Back into the future? I don't know. I could, I could go into more movies. And then every now and again, change and go forward. Change your orientation. If you want to jog, you can jog forward. And then you can do like that guy this morning and jog backwards and look behind you and look in front of you. And it's like, no big deal. What's this space thing? You know. Why am I so uh, hung up on what's in front of me? What's above me? Could I jog up into the stars? Am I going to step in dog poo? All right, the world is a very, very big place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah, you can look hard in here. Good. Now, if you need to go and have a wee or a drink, do that and then come back. We've got a little bit more ATM.